Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. On Wiki Travel, the Pacific Northwest is best known for its beautiful coastline, green interior, rainy weather, and spectacular mountains. But because of all of that, it is also the perfect place to go missing. I'm Carmita, and I grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon. I host a podcast called Missing in the PNW. Now, my podcast is different from others you may have heard because I focus specifically on two things. The first thing is that all of the missing person cases that I cover are strictly from the Pacific Northwest in Oregon and Washington. I know, my title kind of gave that away. The second thing is that my podcast focuses strictly on missing persons from marginalized communities, such as the Black, Hispanic, Native American, slash Indigenous people, and the LGBTQ plus communities. You know, the ones that get absolutely no attention. Now, I'm not an investigative journalist or a reporter. I'm actually just a single mom of three who works in healthcare, loves true crime, and has a passion for social justice. So join me in helping to spread the word on these missing person cases and help be the voice for the ones that are now voiceless. You can find the podcast on all the major streaming apps as well on socials at Missing in the PNW podcast. If you have a case you want me to cover, please email me at missinginthepnw at gmail.com or send me a message through Facebook Messenger. I hope to talk to you soon. And remember, have fun. But be safe. Hey, I don't have a disclaimer for you this time. If you've listened before, you know I'm all about the colorful language. And it's true crime. Oh, I just said I wasn't going to do a disclaimer. And look at what I did. I'm a big silly. Hey there, Rainbow Warriors. Welcome to Beyond the Rainbow, true crimes of the LGBTQ+. I'm your host, CJ, and I'm a little under the weather, but that's okay. I'll try not to sniff and clear my throat too much. Some of you might remember I used to be on Get Vocal a couple years ago. Now that it's vocal, I'm back and I'm bringing the network I founded, Darkcast Network. Darkcast Network has their very own community on Vocal, and some of our shows are joining to be able to bring you the best in true crime, paranormal, conspiracy theories, and darkly obscure shows. So if you get a chance, go to Vocal.com and take a look. It's free to sign up and watch some of your favorite shows live stream. I think you can even go on to get Vocal and see pre-recorded live streams. In fact, the episode I'm covering today, I did a live stream on Vocal with. Have you ordered your true crime podcast calendar yet? Say what? You haven't? Oh no, that just won't do. Go to podcastcalendars.com and get yours today. And check me out because I'm June Centerfold. That's right, me, your hunk of hunk of burning love is all over the month of June. Because it's Pride Month, and I freaking sparkle, that's why. I'll leave a link in the show notes. Join my Patreon at the Unicorn level and get ad-free episodes and early release episodes. Plus, I'll name a unicorn here at my Seabreeze Studio stables in your honor. At the end of every month, we'll take our unicorns out for a ride, and I'll tell you a true crime story that I haven't covered here yet on the regular show. My research expert, Nate, wanted me to share something with all the Rainbow Warriors. In light of the recent mass shooting at the LGBTQ bar in Colorado Springs, which is a case I truly would like to cover soon, but I've been kind of just waiting for it to go to trial, Nate wants me to let you know that the father of the mass shooter has come out to say, at least his son isn't gay. Marinate on that for a second, will you? Because everyone knows it's much better to have a mass murderer for a son than a gay son. What kind of fucked up conservative mega bullshit is that? With that self-proclaimed conservative Republican's father's wisdom, 
It's no wonder his son is a violent killer. But here's the kicker for me. The 22-year-old killer claims to be non-binary and goes by the pronouns they and them. It makes me curious if the father knows about that. Probably not, since his son was taken away from him when the son was younger. The father is a former porn star, which just gets me itching to want to learn more about this case. But in due time. Our case this episode takes us to Hampton Roads. I'll admit, when I first heard of it, I thought it was a series of roads through a tree-lined area of Virginia. I was wrong. Hampton Roads is a body of water and one of the world's largest natural harbors. So why not call it Hampton Harbors? Because that's just too simple. And it's imperative we keep everyone on their jellos. See what I did there? I called toes jellos. Because it's too easy to call things what they really are. Got you thinking, haven't I? Because of a naval headquarters in Hampton Roads, the metropolitan area of the city is swarming with young sailors on weekends some of them quite possibly gay. In fact, for a city of 1.7 million people, nearly 80,000 identify as LGBTQ+. That's quite a few of us for a city in Virginia. I guess it surprises me because Virginia can be a very conservative in nature state, although it does appear to be becoming more liberal. The Hampton area includes Portsmouth, Chesapeake, Norfolk, Suffolk, and Virginia Beach. These areas even boast some gay nightclubs. Although their one lesbian club, the Hershey, it shut down in 2018. The Hampton Roads Killer operated between 1987 and 1996. He wasn't just a serial killer. He was a lust strangler of gay men. For those not sure what a lust murder is, the killer finds sexual gratification in their kills. Oftentimes, the murder happens in the throes of sexual activity with someone. When it comes to the LGBTQ plus community, lust killings are not uncommon. Quite often, self-proclaimed heterosexual men fight their homosexual urges and their emotions are so conflicted that they become violent. The psychiatric diagnosis is called homosexual OCD, and I know I've mentioned it before. It's actually a form of OCD because the inflicted becomes obsessed with thoughts of sex with someone of the same gender, and society has always told them acting on such urges is wrong. It's definitely more prevalent in men although I'm sure it must happen to women too. We just don't hear of the cases, most likely because the women it happens to don't normally become violent to others due to it. The first known gay man to die at the hands of the murderer dubbed the Hampton Roads Killer was Charles Frank Smith on July 17, 1987. Charles was born where I was born in Sacramento, California. He was only 19 years old. His body was found in Chesapeake. Charles was the only victim found still clothed. He was wearing jeans and sneakers. With his being so young and so far from Northern California, I wondered if perhaps he was an enlisted military man. Unfortunately, there isn't too much information on any of the victims, which is something we in the true crime community find extremely frustrating. The second known gay victim was 26-year-old Joseph Ray. He was last seen July 12, 1988. His body was found a week later on an interstate on-ramp in Chesapeake. Due to the summer heat, his naked body was so decomposed, his cause of death was undetermined. In January 1989, a gay man named Stacy Renau was found naked and murdered and I'm going to quit saying that they were found naked. Every single body that was found, aside from the very first victim, was found naked. The only Stacy Renau I could find, and I don't think it's a common name for men, was a sailor who died in January of 1989, but the page said he died in Texas. 
which is either his family denying his death was in the Hampton Roads area of Virginia just because they didn't want anyone to know their son was possibly gay, or because there was a different male, Stacy Renau, who died the same month and the same year as the victim. If it's a different Stacy Renau, what a weird coincidence, huh? The fourth victim to be found was John W. Ross Jr. in January of 1992. It seems there was a bit of a gap in the Hampton Roads killer's tendencies. A three-year gap, actually. It always makes me think that maybe the killer was incarcerated for that time, or maybe moved out of the area, or something was going on in his life that he needed to take a break. Victim number five was 32-year-old Billy Lee Dixon. He had a very well-built physique, and he posed naked in gay erotic magazines. Billy was pretty much living a nomadic-type lifestyle at the time of his murder. He was born in Norfolk, Virginia, and he had come from a very large family of four sisters and three brothers. Being gay was not something Billy readily talked about to anyone especially his family. Billy's body was found off a road in the Isle of White County, about 35 miles from Hampton Roads. Reginald Joyner's body was found in Suffolk in March 1993, and that's really all the information on Reginald Joyner I could find. 27-year-old Raymond Bostick's body would be found on June 28, 1993, and it was found in Norfolk. Just three months after Raymond Bostick's murder, in September of 1993, Robert Neal would be found in Chesapeake. Victim number nine's body would arise in 1994 in Suffolk. His name, Garland Taylor Jr. His parents denied that their son was gay. In fact, they quit talking to investigators. They could not fathom the notion that Garland liked sex with men. Garland had just married a woman shortly before he disappeared. But the investigators weren't making up allegations about the victim being gay. They were going off their sources that they found on the streets and with their informants. Perhaps Garland was bisexual and had an encounter with the wrong man one night. The body of Samuel Alif was found in May 1995 in Chesapeake. Samuel lived a transient life. His body was found on a cul-de-sac. He was identified through his fingerprints as he had been arrested before for petty theft. Jesse James Spence was the 11th victim found in 1996, and the very last known victim of the Hampton Roads killer was Andrew Andre Smith in July 1996. After his murder, the killing seemed to stop. All of the victims tested either had rohypnol or liquid X in their systems, and both of those are essentially date rape drugs. Some had cocaine in their system as well. The date rape drugs would explain why there were no defensive wounds on any of the victims. Most all of the men had had anal sex right before their death. Now, I, I hesitate to say that. The sex might not have been consensual. They might have been raped. Almost every single victim had sketchy employment histories, and they were all night owls who were active late at night and into the early morning hours. Ten were strangled with a rope or cord, although two of the victims were so decomposed it was hard to tell how they died. There was an arrest made. A 41-year-old man named Elton Manning Jackson Elton was a man that the detectives had on their radars. It would seem Elton had sex with one of the victims, Andrew Andre Smith, and it was just two days before Andrew's body was found. And since he was the last known victim of the Hampton Roads killer, police thought that they found their man with Elton. When Elton was arrested, he denied knowing Andrew, let alone having any kind of consensual sex with him. Later, he claimed, Look, I'm a black gay man. I was afraid. So I lied about knowing Andrew. Yes, we had sex. It was a nice time. But then he turns up dead. I, I was afraid. Elton still went to trial for Andrew's murder. All of the evidence that was against him 
was three or four droplets of Andrew's blood on his bedding. And I'm going to get a little graphic here. But isn't it possible Elton was well endowed and maybe caused a little tear in Andrew's anus? Or maybe Andrew had really bad hemorrhoids. I don't know, forgive me, but three or four drops of blood doesn't seem like a whole lot of evidence. And it seems like it could be easily explained away. But at Elton's trial, three witnesses came forward testifying that Elton tried to choke him with a leather belt while having gay consensual sex. Funny, not one of these witnesses was fearful enough to file a police report after it happened. Let's face it, people have kinks, that's why there's leather bars and leather shows. Bondage, sexual asphyxiation, sadomasochism, those are all real things that some people enjoy. I know leather bars and shows can be highly popular in the LGBTQ community. Other than the killings stopping after Elton was arrested, I know had I been on this jury, I would have been hard-pressed to find him guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. For instance, how did the three witnesses who came forward at the trial escape unscathed if Elton was the Hampton Roads killer? I know it can happen. Dahmer even had a victim escape, as did Robert Burdello, the Kansas City butcher. But three victims? And Elton was only being charged for the murder of the last victim because there was absolutely zero evidence tying him to the other 11 murders. And I'm really not trying to defend Elton. But it seems to me, once again, detectives are getting away with being very lazy when there's still 11 other victims who need justice. A jury found Elton guilty of the first-degree murder of Andrew Smith and they spent a whole whopping 20 minutes deciding they wanted Elton to serve a life sentence, which his judge agreed. Elton has filed for at least one appeal since, but nothing has come of it. The other 11 murders should be considered active, although they've been shoved back into a closet somewhere in a police station. Police believe Elton Manning Jackson to be the less killer of 12 gay or bisexual men. Police believe Elton Manning Jackson to be the Hampton Roads killer. As far as they're concerned, case closed. What do you guys think? There are seven common reasons for wrongful convictions if Elton was indeed wrongfully convicted. Number one, faulty witness testimony which in this case could have been so with three of his sexual partners. Number two, junk science, which I covered in another one of my cases with a quack dentist who claimed bite marks matching a suspect ended up with the suspect in prison for a crime she didn't commit. This doesn't seem to apply in this case. Number three, false confession. Elton maintained his innocence from the very beginning, so that also doesn't seem to be a factor in this case. Number four, informants and jailhouse snitches. We've seen this time and time again in cases where a jailhouse snitch will rat out another inmate who may be erroneously boasting of a crime that he said he committed but didn't. This is also not the case here. Number five, governmental misconduct. This includes detectives, police departments, and prosecutors. While I don't necessarily believe the investigators purposely misconducted themselves in these cases, I also don't feel like they stayed with the cases and pursued them as much as they should have. Why? Oh, it goes back to the age-old problem of the victims being gay. The killer was doing a service to society by ridding the streets of those nasty gay sinners. And honestly, the LGBTQ community is fearful to report crimes against them because they feel like police don't take action or believe that the crimes against the LGBTQ are serious enough, which could be why the three witnesses in Elton's trial didn't go to the police after they said Elton attacked them. That's a possibility, I guess. Number six, inadequate defense lawyers. And I really didn't see much on Elton's defense team to know if they did their jobs to the fullest. Number seven, unfair bias judges. This is never supposed to happen if our justice system worked the way it should. But unfortunately, 
the justice system doesn't always work the way it was meant to. Like we see with bad cops, there's very biased judges out there. Many of them are in the southern Bible Belt states. They're biased because of their moral upbringing and religion. I checked, and it looks like Virginia is considered a southern Bible Belt state, so biased judges might very well exist there. I wasn't able to find the credentials or the reviews of the judge in Elton's case. Therefore, I'm not really sure if there was a bias to this judge. And I'd like to add a number eight, which would be circumstantial evidence, also known as indirect evidence. Circumstantial evidence implies that the person being tried is guilty. For instance, in this case, the blood droplets of Andrew Smith in Elton's bed implied he must have killed Andrew. But that's all circumstantial at best which makes me believe that the jury didn't really do their due diligence in this case. I don't know, warriors. I've seen people convicted on even less. Which shows me again our justice system doesn't always work always. So how are we supposed to trust in it? Rest in power, victims of the Hampton Roads Killer. Our true crime quickie this episode also occurred in Virginia. I guess I'm picking on Virginia this episode. Sorry, Virginia. So my question to you is this. What does it take to get you riled up and pissed off at your partner? Give it some thought. What kinds of things can they say or do to make you say, Oh, I could just kill them. I would think in order to get that response from you, it would have to be something pretty awful, right? How about wearing sweatpants to date night? The year was 2015. 21-year-old Samantha Shrestha invited the 23-year-old girl she was dating, Jessica Ewing, over for what was supposed to be a nice, romantic evening in with a home-cooked meal, wine, dessert, and probably consensual lesbian sex afterwards. Both young women were Virginia Tech students. Jessica was so excited about her special night with Samantha, who everyone called Sam. Sam was in the biology program and aspired to be a doctor someday. Jessica really liked Sam, maybe even loved her. And like some of us do, we build an ideal fantasy of how something is supposed to happen in our heads. Jessica had her fantasy night all mapped out. She spent hours getting ready, putting on makeup, doing her hair, putting on her dress, and spritzing herself with perfume. If you're a woman who does this, you know this takes time. I'm not a woman that does this, but my daughter is. And it was no different for Jessica because she put this vision of a perfect romantic night in her head. After primping herself to knock Sam's socks off, she grabbed a chilled bottle of wine and a can of whipped cream and she headed to Sam's place. Once Sam opened the door, Jessica's built-up balloon of a fantasy immediately burst, because when Sam opened the door, she had on no makeup. She was wearing a comfy, oversized t-shirt and sweatpants. Jessica felt very overdressed, and very overprepared for the evening. I mean, what the hell? Was this date not as important to Sam as it was Jessica? Staring at Jessica and how beautiful she was and the look of disappointment on Jessica's face, it made Sam go change into something a little dressier. Dinner went well, wine was great, dessert was yummy, and the whipped cream, the dessert to the dessert, was even playfully used and squirted on each other's body parts, which, as whipped cream often does, led to sex. Laying in bed afterwards and not totally over how Sam opened the door and sweats in a t-shirt, Jessica brought it up again and asked Sam why it seemed she wasn't as into Jessica as Jessica was into Sam. This led to an angry argument between the two young women. Jessica called Sam a spoiled bitch, and Sam fired right back at Jessica that this relationship was just an experimental phase for her. It wasn't a serious thing. She wasn't even sure she was into girls, let alone Jessica. 
For Jessica, this was the proverbial straw. She forgave a lot of Sam's shortcomings. But this admission was just too much. A blind rage overcame Jessica as she put Sam into a chokehold, and she squeezed the last breath out of Sam. Then Jessica panicked, and she called a couple of guy friends. She told them what she did, and she asked them to help her dispose of Sam's body. Sam's body was found several days later in an abandoned, older model Mercedes. She was wrapped in a sleeping bag and stuffed into the back seat. Jessica and her two guy friends were arrested. The guys were charged with accessory after the fact, and Jessica was charged with first-degree murder. Jessica took an Alford plea deal, meaning she wasn't admitting she did it, even though the prosecution had enough evidence to prove she did. Jessica ended up sentenced to 80 years in prison, which has already been reduced to 45 years. I think a good dose of mental health care is in order for that chick also. Rest in power, Sam. Love you, Rainbow Warriors. And remember, it's not a crime to be gay. Unless you're a murderer. <laughs>